Okay. Talk to me a little bit about the uh, that era. You remember your your first recollection is that era and how you how you became involved and in, you know how the came about maybe. Uh, I mean, how I became involved was I was writing. There was a free magazine at the time called Cheap Thrills that the CPI people uh, would hand out at concerts, and uh, I somehow finagled uh, a monthly column called Bump to Bump where. I mean, you could sense, it didn't take a rocket science to figure out that there was a whole new kind of movement and a whole new kind of music happening. And, and you saw, like, if you, if you got the British magazines, they were talking about this new, uh, like, it didn't have a name yet. You know what I mean? Like, the punk rock tag didn't really happen until maybe early 77, late 76. Before that, there was no name to it. All you knew was that in New York, Patti Smith was, was this person creating something. Um, everybody read um, Rock Scene magazine, which, uh, which was like the Bible of, what was, of all the cool new groups. So you, you'd read about the early Ramones, you'd, s you'd read about Patti Smith, you'd see stuff about the New York Dolls. Um, and a lot of the people that went to the Ontario College of Art, which is the Diodes people, at one point, probably in the summer of 76, they went down to New York on a, on a school trip. And because a lot of them had been reading about this whole new CBGB scene, they kind of wandered off and discovered punk rock on their own, and they came back. But what really galvanized everything was when the first Ramones record came out. Actually, sorry, I'll take that back. The first thing that happened was Patti Smith went on tour. She was pretty well the first kind of standard bearer of that new music to come through. She came on tour, and you kind of saw a whole new way of approaching music. Here was like a poetess, and she had Lenny Kay, who was a, basically a really well-renowned rock critic who had compiled the Nuggets CD compilation. So you got this like one foot in 60s. <laughs> Be right back. So you would chop all this up, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it was pretty amazing considering there was no internet, no high speed communication then, but yet it was like word of mouth, fanzines, a whole bunch of different factors made it possible for everybody to kind of know that something was happening musically, that there's a whole new way of doing things, a much simpler, and it was it was basically the, that whole crowd that, I mean, you gotta, you gotta remember, this was a time when not everybody had heard of Iggy Pop. It was like, only a few people had heard of Iggy Pop, and it was sort of that Iggy Pop New York Dolls crowd that kept this sort of underground communication happening. It was almost like, record collectors keeping in touch because there was that whole stiff records thing that started happening in England. Um, just a lot of different magical combinations. So when you get to the Toronto Hamilton scene, uh, you had guys like myself kind of writing things. In Hamilton you had record collectors like Brian Bird, uh, Emants, Krem Kremitz or whatever his name is, you know, keeping in touch with fanzines. And a lot of this information now gets passed on to the bands, you know. So it's like, a, you know, we're not the only geeks around. But you need something to galvanize everybody into action. So the first thing that happened was Patti Smith went on tour. And she was like the first crusader. She went all, you know, through North America. She went into England. And she was not a soft-spoken woman. She was on this crusade to bring real rock and roll back into rock and roll, real primitive rock and roll. The next thing you saw happen was the Ramones come through. And that was the more important of the two. Uh, because what happened was, when the Ramones came to Toronto, everybody, all the outcasts of society, of musical society, were at that show, at the New Yorker. So, but they didn't know each other then. So at one hand, the bands that would become, the, the, the guys that would become the diodes were in the audience. I was in the audience. Um, the teenage head guys were there, all the record collector guys were there. 
And I think when I was at that Ramon show, I kind of noticed a group of people who seemed to be very knowledgeable about a lot of what was happening. And it turns out it was a bunch of guys from Hamilton. Probably some of them might have been in Teenage Head, I don't know. But I think I got, and what would become a bit of a tradition was at a lot of these cool shows, I would meet these guys from Hamilton. And I was living in Oakville at the time. And I would get lifts back <laughs> to Oakville. And at one point, I think I had Gord Lewis and some of the guys from Teenage Head in my apartment and we were just kind of having beers, you know. But they hadn't really made a move as Teenage Head yet. We were just kind of... That was the other wonderful thing about it is, is it was very naive times. You know, there was no ruthlessness or no music industry or anything. It was just basically music fans, you know, uh, discovering stuff. So what happened after that Ramones gig is whoever was in that audience immediately left and sort of went, we can do that. Let's start a band. So overnight, six or seven bands sprang up in Toronto. Now, you got to multiply this by every city that the Ramones played on that tour. And overnight, you've got like dozens of new punk bands, although they weren't really called punk yet. Dozens of bands just springing forth into creation. Now, when the Ramones hit England, the same thing happened. But England being England, they thought uh, the Ramones and a lot of the New York bands were kind of square, not very stylish, kind of slow, not very interesting. It was the same phenomenon uh, that happened when the British beat bands of the 60s took over the American blues idiom. The American blues was kind of slow, sluggish. The guys doing it were like kind of boring, smelly old guys. What if we got a bunch of hip happening, young British guys doing it? So same thing happened to punk. Punk all of a sudden became stylish, became uh, co-opted by people like Malcolm McLaren who turned it into a whole new sort of art performance thing, whatever. It started coming back now to America. But just before that happened, the Toronto scene was already in full swing. Before we even heard of who the Sex Pistols were, were there was already a Toronto scene, which was the Diodes. Um, teenage Heads started to make forays in there. The vile tones were already happening. Um, and the crash and burn started to happen. And the crash and burn basically was the Diodes rehearsal space. It was at the, the ground floor of uh, this building at the corner of Pearl and John Street in Toronto. Uh, it was a building owned by the a group, uh, an arts group called SEAC, the Center for Experimental Arts and Communication. And they had had a performance installation down there. I forget what it was now. So there's all this leftover bits of debris and wood and stuff. And we kind of went in there and created a club because there's no place for the bands to play. I mean, the only club that existed was the Colonial. And you couldn't play upstairs. You had to play downstairs. Um, and there was the Beverly Tavern, you could play there. But outside of that, there was no, nowhere you could play. So we kind of went, well, let's start a club. We'll get a special occasion permit. It was only open uh, Friday and Saturdays. And uh, it was only open maybe two months, you know. And, but there's this whole myth about that club. And, you know, people seem to think it was open every night of the week. and. Blondie played there and all this stuff. Well, I'm like, why not? Let's perpetuate that myth. You know, it doesn't really matter anymore. But um, Teenage Head played there, uh, and uh, it was a fantastic show. But I had to find them because they smashed a hole through the uh, <laughs> through the stage. But uh, I mean, you got to hand it. This is when Jack Morrow and John Brower started getting involved with the band and you could see like the entourage coming in they had TV cameras you know uh, TV stations checking them out but this was Teenage Head in their prime I mean this was I mean the diodes I mean the, the diodes were they might they might have been the kind of the intellectual impetus of the scene 
the vowel tones were like the heart of it. No, no, not the heart of it. The vowel tones were like the sort of the animal energy of it. But Teenage Head were like the rock and roll heart of the Toronto punk scene because they somehow managed to combine like everything that you liked about Gene Vincent and everything that you liked about Iggy Pop into this one character, Frank Venom, who was just a natural rock star, you know. Uh, there was no ulterior motive to him. There was no, you know, he, he like, you have Steve Leckie on one, one hand, who would be, of course, Mr. Nihil Nihilism, you know, Mr. Punk Rock. And on the other hand, you had the, the diodes who were like, you know, this very intelligent sort of group constantly, you know, thinking about punk within its proper context today, tomorrow, whatever. And then you've got Frank Venom living for today and only today. Um, and living for rock and roll. There's no art to Frank Venom. Frank Venom does not care about art or intellectualizing about his place in the rock timeline. You know, he's all about performance. And I think the thing with, with rock and roll is it's almost like there's this live wire, this current constantly on. And I think Frank just kind of clutched it and he just, that energy just ran into him just a little too long. Maybe it might have fried him. You know what I mean? Like, you just get too close to that flame. Um, but Frank Venom in his prime, I mean, there's... I don't think, you know, now, looking back 20, 30 years, you know, I don't think anybody could touch him. You know, the guy was a natural... Just like somebody like Iggy Pop is a, is a phenomenon, so was Frank Venom. You know, and I think he set the tone. He set the tone for style, set the tone for... Um, and that was the other kind of wonderful thing, is like a lot of these bands were so unique. Um, there's no way you could confuse Dio's Teenage Hair or the Vile Tones. They, they were not interchangeable bands whatsoever. Um, but it was almost like the 60s bands, you know. There were always, there was this constant competition, constant... Uh, energy to move forward and get better and better and better and just to create something new. What about their sound? You were talking about Frankie, but I think Gordy's is important in the grand scheme of things. He wrote a lot of the, maybe, the songwriting, but he's got a very distinctive, what I've heard is called uh, bone, uh, New York Bonehead guitar playing. Yeah, and this... It was like, I mean, they came, I mean, they, Hamilton, is like there's more record collectors per square foot in, in Hamilton. And, and I think the beauty of the Teenage Head guys is they knew their rock history. So it was like you kind of got the pop of the Flaming Groovies, um, the energy of the Ramones, the, the, the primal instinct of Iggy Pop. Like it's just this magical blend. You know, and, and if, if Gord was the architect of that, he did an amazing job of, of simplifying all that into this one cohesive sort of energy force that hit you, you know, like it was just, um, you felt inspired watching them, you know. Did they write good pop songs in your mind? Yeah, I mean... Picture My Face, not like a... It's a classic. Picture My Face, um, the one about... Um, Kissing the Carpet. I mean, that first album is incredible. And then Let's Shake. I mean, I perform Let's Shake with Dave Rave today. You know, I mean, 30 years later, if you want to get a crowd jumping and hopping anywhere in Canada, all you got to do is play Let's Shake. And peop people are going to storm the stage drunk as loons, you know. I mean, I, there's not too many other bands that you could pull their repertoire. And, and, and do and have such an effect with, you know. Maybe maybe the diode's tired of waking up tired it has that effect. But um, you know, I mean, the, the, the beauty of uh, Teenage Head too is is they were really they managed to, to do all that 
relatively unaffected by the Toronto scene because they still lived in Hamilton. So they didn't really have to worry about some of the inner politics of, of, of the Toronto scene. They, just, they were a bit more, I thought they were a little bit more pure in their stance. Um, what was the response in terms of the band playing? I mean, did that did that begin the point where they were packing the club? Was it? I mean, what was the uh, buzz like for them once they played it once or twice? Was, and was the crowd was the question very important in terms of their own career at that point? I think. Yeah. Um. Crash the crash and burn. I thought. Because most of those bands only played there once. There was only really the one-time opportunity. But the most important gig at the Crash and Burn was actually a private gig we had one night um, when the Ramones came back again. We had just about every band in the Toronto scene hit the stage for a guest set. And so you had whoever managed to get into the club that night. And there is video footage somewhere of this, and maybe you'll find it. Um, but on stage, one night only, you had Teenage Head, The Diodes, The Vile Tones, The Curse. I think the B-Girls were on stage. You had the Dead Boys jamming with, with The Vile Tones. You know, Vile Tones jamming with Teenage Head. It's just this incredible. It was like, here we are. You know, deal with it. And that was probably one of the most important gigs for them. Um, because the rest of the scene now, the Toronto bands saw what the, saw that the standards were getting high, you know. Uh, Is that ever given its due in your mind? Is a band like Teenage Head underrated in the grand scheme of things in terms of Canadian rock and roll history? Yeah. Uh, when you pick up the the Canadian rock encyclopedia that you can buy now for six ninety nine at Coles, there's absolutely no mention of the. Toronto punk scene, but there's tons of entries for bands that who cares about, you know, um, and this constantly infuriates me to this day, you know, there's all these so-called Canadian history books and, and there's no mention of the punk scene or it's mentioned uh, in, in a very derogatory fashion like these bands don't matter. Um, but to me, if it wasn't for these bands, you wouldn't have some, some, some of the bands that are around today. I mean, you know, we opened all the doors and, and we get nothing for it. You know, just none of these bands made money. Teenage Head certainly haven't made money. The Diodes only got money this year and they only got $100 each from their Sony uh, reissue. You know, God knows what the Valtones ever made, you know. It's a drag because, I mean, you got to picture... I mean, it's hard, it's hard to believe, but in 1977 there was no infrastructure. There was no alternative weekly papers. There was no alternative college radio. There was no much music. There was no, um, there was no indie labels. There was no uh, Canadian music magazines, really. There was nothing, absolutely nothing. And whatever me media coverage you got was usually derogatory or uh, hey, check this out, look at these crazy punks, you know. And then uh, as soon as all the coverage started coming from England about the Sex Pistols throwing up at airports, there was this whole new face of punk rock now. And it was like the English face of punk rock. And what I noticed at the Crash and Burn was we went from rock fans or artists and creative people uh, coming together to create something new to all of a sudden we're being infiltrated by Lugans, by drunks, um, by sort of every social outcast who suddenly had a flag, which was the punk flag, which, which if you subscribe to the English way, which, which was like anybody can pick up guitar, you do whatever you want, it's anarchy baby. So what happens is now, I'm running the Crash and Burn Club, and I've got like criminals, ex criminals smashing, smashing our windows, people throwing glass on the floor, like picking fights, 
and you know, and, and you grab these guys and you go, why are you doing this? What is your problem? Goes, well, it's punk rock, man. Aren't you supposed to like go crazy? And I'm like, well, yeah, I guess so. But man, I gotta sweep the floor tomorrow. I mean, I gotta clean up. I gotta clean up your puke. I don't feel like doing that. You know, there's one guy I had to chase. You know, a couple of blocks, and I find out. You know, the guy was out on parole, and he read about punk rock in the Toronto Star, and he came down to cause trouble. And that's when I knew that, you know, suddenly things had changed. Um, suddenly the, that whole fresh naivety was, was gone. You know, now we're coming into a whole new phase, and it was kind of like what had happened before, what had happened to the hippies, what had happened to the beatniks. You know, there's that sort of magical flowering in the beginning, and then we're going to go down this other dark road now. And so subsequently, as a result of that, this whole new violent nature, uh, not so much the musicians or the music, but the whole new, the sort of, the second level of groups now that come in. You've got the ugly, you've got the curse, um, you've got, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but there's a new, uglier crowd, a whole new, more violent aspect coming in. Um, was Teenage Head able to uh, survive all that? So, I mean, See, the, 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 be the beauty of Teenage Head is, because their music was based in a lot of traditional roots, like rockabilly, uh, like 60s rock and roll, this is all stuff that you could take into a regular bar, and the regular guy can relate to it. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's got those basic boogie blues, rockabilly things. The vile tones, this is a very confrontation, confrontational band. You can't really take that into a mainstream mid-70s rock bar atmosphere. Um, the diodes, they almost had to wait till 1980 before they could sort of get into the regular rock bars, by which time they had gone from sort of this pop punk band into a pop harder uh, almost pre-metal type of band, you know what I mean? Like the whole other sonic approach. Teenage Head right from the get-go, they weren't restricted by the punk label. They could go anywhere they chose just because of that charismatic nature of their music. And then they were also probably the first band to get a real manager. And I think that's the big difference when you have a guy like Jack Morrow who comes from the 60s and the 70s, and he'd been a manager, you know, and a hustler and a go-getter and a beatnik and all sorts of stuff. He was able to sort of take this band, make a few minor tweaks and adjustments, and suddenly go, you know, forget this punk rock circuit of, you know, nickel and dime clubs. Let's get into the big leagues. Let's move on up the Young Street circuit. Let's get a record deal. Let's, let's go for it. Let's harness this energy into money. And as soon as they got their Attic Records deal, which is interesting, because I worked at Attic, and you could see, like, this guy, he was just creating excitement. You know, like, they had this thing where you had a Teenage Head coupon booklet. If you went, you know, if, if you went to five of their gigs and got, and got your booklet stamped or something, you won something at the end of it. Just create a sense of um, community around Teenage Head with their fans. You know, he tried to make every show, every Teenage Head show, now we're into the early 80s, was this event. They had this great crowd of people like Gail Manning and Paul Kobach and all these guys just creating this excitement um, around the band. Like th this was a party band. You had to go and see Teenage Head. Every show was packed. Um, eventually culminating to the point where they're headlining Ontario Place and, and, and that big old riot, you know. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're on, on route to their big New York showcase and, of course, the big accident. And I think that big accident, um, I think a lot of things changed after that. I think Frank probably changed after that. Gord, I'm sure, probably changed after that. Um, you could see where Teenage Head went from 
naive rock fans caught up in, in the excitement of the early punk scene to the excitement of suddenly being able to headline clubs that they would never have imagined being able to get into to suddenly now now we're a business and an enterprise you know what I mean all within the span of about three three years um, and I think once money and the prospect of making large amounts of money enters the picture a lot of perspectives change maybe the music takes a back seat I don't know you know what I mean it's kind of like there's different priorities now so there's, d there's more people to pay you've gone from maybe five guys in the band and a couple of your buddies hanging out to you've got a manager to pay you've got three or four people on your road crew to pay you've got to make X amount of money every night so there's got to be pressure you know uh, every day that you're not playing is probably $2,500 that you're not making that has to feed your machinery like you're forced to get into a higher level but it's in Canada at that time it was a catch-22 because as soon as you got out of the club say and started headlining small halls well you can only do the, your hometown hall maybe once a year so suddenly you know you're so the trick was be big enough to be able to play the clubs every week but don't get big enough to headline Massey Hall or something because then you'll be really screwed it's like what are you supposed to do in between you know the 11 months in between playing Massey Hall every year so this was a real conundrum in those days for Canadian bands um, unless you got an American record deal and went down south or something but I think now it's a little different there's more places to play and people have managed to overcome that but um, <coughs> I get the feeling when I talk to the when we talk to the guys I mean by and large they look pretty much like carbon copies I and mean, there's, there's a few more age lines in that and they did when they were kids it's kind of wondering if it kind of gives a perspective on I don't know, is it a rest of our lessons? Is it Peter Pan? Why won't these guys let go? We still see them play the clubs. You can see that by a lot of musicians now from that era. It's, uh, it's, um, it's the great secret about music. Uh, you don't even have to be in a band. It's like, even if you're involved in the music industry and you, and you really care, um, it's like it's a strange elixir of youth. You know, like you s I see it all the time. It's like, it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's people. It, it's almost like li little gnomes. You know, like they they've got little old man bodies and wrinkles, but they've got little kid haircuts, and they still dress like they used to dress. And it's, you know, it, but it it does keep you young. You know, it, it's it's that again. It's it's that energy source. You know, that kind of electrical wire above you. And the trick is to just kind of get into it in, in measured amounts. Because if you get in too far, you'll get lost. And and but yeah, it's it's that eternal fire. You know, it's like. Some people can control it. Some people will always be trying to relive lost youth. And I mean, uh, the saddest thing is when you run into some of these people and all they can talk about is how wonderful it was in 1976 or 1977. You know, and some of them will pull out the one good review they might have ever gotten in their whole lives and they've still got it in their pocket. And, you know, Wilder Penfield, this is what he said about me in 1976. You know, but on the one hand it's sad but on the other hand you know if that's what's keeping you alive and, and keeping you youthful and, and keeping you tapped into the energy then who who am I to criticize that you know it's kept me young <laughs> you know it's um like a Frank Venom I mean the guy I hold 45 46 years old who knows you wouldn't know it. he kind of looks like a rough 30 30 year old guy Still slim and trim, you know. In his face. That's just it. That whole 
the, the wise and known look, you know. It, it's, it's that whole, you know, um, from 10 feet out, they still look like 10-year-old kids. But as you start zooming in, it's like, oh my God, it's like a little old man. Or, or when you see, uh, it's like you're walking down the street and you see the back of this really cute chick and you go, wow, look at that. And you, you walk by and it's, it's the soul's ruin, you know. And that it's kind of the same with these rock musicians, you know. It's like, they still think they're 19 years old, you know. And some of them wear it well and some of them don't, but... Uh, but I think what it is is, is, is you're not, you haven't given up. You know, like, you know, like I look at people that I know, maybe not in the music industry, and uh, these people are 10 years younger than I am, but they look like they're 10 years older than I am, and it's almost embarrassing. Like, I won't even say how old I am, because I know it'll, it'll make them depressed or something, you know? It's like, I haven't done anything special in my life, but, you know, I just listen to records all day, so I guess that's what it is, you know? I think the scene is, it, it's, it's almost like a resignation that people have. It's kind of like, you know, records, all that stuff, that's kid stuff. I gotta get serious now. And I think that's the trick. As soon as you let your body know how old you really are, you're out of here, you know? Um, but as long as you keep thinking you're younger than you are, as long as you can hang on to that energy, then you can, you can pretty well fool your body for a while. But what about the choices one makes? I mean, some people, <coughs> you talk to the guys again, Steve is a laborer. Mm -hmm. uh, um, well, John and Mark is a laborer, Frank's a laborer. I mean, it would seem to me that those dreams are a long ways away from laying, not even laying bricks, it's delivering bricks to a bricklayer's assistant. It's not about laying oil on a roof, it's about climbing a ladder. But it seemed to me that Whereas other people have tried to make a, some sort of a living, they've had something else going on in their life, these guys have become slaves to their lifestyle, to a degree. Because that's 45 minutes on stage nowadays, the, 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 those are far and few between moments. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree that most of these guys, at least if they're still doing it, live for that, I mean, they could probably only be living for those moments. If they're keeping a dream alive, it's not... It's, it's, almost, like, um, it's almost like an addiction. You know what I mean? Like that, the, that, that spotlight. It's, it's like, well, if I can just go through all this crap of my day, just so at the end of it, I can just hop on that stage, even if it's for 45 minutes. I've got the lights, I've got my guitar, I've got my buddies with me. For 45 minutes, I'm not going to feel any pain. I won't have any problems. I'm in this whole other planet, you know, that's all it is now. It's almost like that's the drug that keeps these people going, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's choices you make, you know, it's like, and it's also punishment in many ways, like it's, it's, I mean, I don't want to say it's a punishment, but it's almost like, it's almost like, well, they've, they've They've stayed true. I mean, that's what they are. They're musicians. They're not supposed to be um, computer programmers who happen to be in a band. You know, uh, that is the problem with if you go with through through rock history. All the great visionaries are. You know, those are the guys that have have, have led the most you know, troublesome lives, you know, Charlie Parker, you know, Iggy Pop, um, people that are, I mean, it, it's almost like it's, it's um, you know, okay, to be this creative, you can't be this creative without the, the turmoil that inspires the creativity, you know. Well, if you stop being creative and just start, just, just keep living in the past, and you can't get beyond that. I'm just trying to compare some musicians to other musicians who, some guys have kind of been able to leave well enough alone and move on, yeah. and still keep a younger appearance, and still have a rock and roll lifestyle to a degree, but they kind of understand about paying mortgages and yeah. uh, responsibility and running a business, and 
And what about guys that just can't don't seem to be able to make that leap? Is there anything ironic about that? Is there anything that you could feel a little, is that a little sad that people don't understand when it's time to kind of move on? Yeah, just give me a sec. Sorry, if you could just pause it. Uh, One second, I'll just uh, yep. get Rick to make sure he's rolling here. I'm rolling. Okay. You can talk in generality, it doesn't have to do with teenagers. Yeah, things. I think the problem sometimes, you know, It, it, I think it's a condition that affects, not, uh, it's not just rock musicians, I mean, you, you're, you're dealing with, you know, poets and writers and, and a lot of really creative people, these are lost souls, and that this is the only thing they know how to do, and then it's like the ones that survive that come out the other end are people, I mean, uh, it's luck of the draw, you know what I mean? It's like, if at the beginning you're lucky enough to get a manager or someone to be able to give you guidance and direct you and almost provide you with a safety net, you can at least start learning and understanding how things work so that when they go away, you can at least have a plan or a, a guide to follow. Um, if you don't really have any of that, and, and if a lot of it is of the moment for the moment, when your support system goes away, there's really nobody there to take their place. So you're left to your own devices. And basically, if you've never had to do the business before, never had to do any of the bookings before, never had to do anything, you don't really know how to do it. So you can take the, initi the initiative of trying to learn it, trying to find somebody else to do it, or you just fall into a predictable routine that you can control. And that, unfortunately, invariably is the weekend gig, the small time club. Uh, these are all things that you can get a handle on. But the minute you try to move on into higher areas, you don't know who to phone. Um, it's difficult to promote yourself, to phone up a newspaper and go, hey, you know, you should write about me. Um, a lot of musicians are shy. A lot of creative people are shy, don't like to talk publicly. Um, it's sad. It's, you've got, it's basically a bunch of lost little kids looking for dad or looking for parents. You know, it's like a, a, like a, a bunch of stray kittens, you know, off, off in the woods. And musicians are probably the most exploited people there are because everybody seems to make money but the musician. You know, uh, simply because the musician is so happy to be making music. He's so happy to be given the opportunity to make music that it's, they're easy to distract. Like in the 50s, they would give musicians cars whenever they, the guy would show up at the record company. Like, Where's my money? Hey, well, here's a car. Go away, right? And, uh, I mean, the record industry is an industry that, you know, in many ways, some of the major labels today were started by criminals or had dubious accounting practices. You know, I mean, they've only really started cleaning up their act recently. Now, as soon as the accountants took over the record companies, you know, they've had to clean up their acts and go back and settle things. But certainly in the 50s and 60s, there was all these scams to not pay artists. And that, that is always the way it is, you know. And you can't escape it to this day. If a record company can get away with not paying an artist, they will, you know, if they can charge back, you know, every chocolate bar an employee makes to somebody's recording budget, they will, you know. I mean, I shouldn't say that, but that still goes on, you know, it's just, you know, club owners, you know, if, if they can pay you $30 instead of 300 they will. You know, it's it's a sad testament. And then, you know, it's like looking from the outside. I mean, it's frustrating. You're like, why is Frankie Venom, you know,
playing a dive in Hamilton when he should be he headlining Massey Hall. Why is a guy headlining Massey Hall with half of Frank Venom's talent there and Frank Venom isn't? You know? Well, there could be several reasons for you that. Know. One could be alcoholism. Yeah. You know, it's... Self-destruction is runs rampant in this business, too. Yeah. Right? It's like people just don't know when enough is enough. You know, it's... Everybody's got a crutch. Yeah, you know. It's, um... It's sad, but at the same time, it's like, you know... It's like when you're dealing with an alcoholic, there's not much you can do. You can't really help. You know, uh... It's almost like some people really have to hit bottom before they start coming back up again. You know, some before some people kind of go, you know, what the hell am I doing here? You know, this is like, you know, some really bad club. I shouldn't be here. I should be doing something else, you know. And, but that's, that's also Canada, you know. We, we totally, uh, we're a nation that, as soon as you make it, we'll do our damnedest to bring you down and slap you down. You know, uh, if you're successful, then you've somehow scammed your way to that success. It's not real. And uh, it's almost like, you know, you almost have to be at it for 20 or 30 years, and then they'll finally leave you alone. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, he must be legit then. He's been doing it for 30 years and he's still successful. Um, Someone uh, suggests, I think it may have been spreading, I don't know if you agree with this or not. I kind of think there's something valid in this. He's 55, he's still playing rock and roll. And he said that rock and roll, relatively speaking, is a rather young culture. And rock and roll basically now is where jazz was back in the 40s and 50s, where guys could start, where it was considered kind of, wow, an, old, an older jazz guy was considered a bit of an anomaly because the, at that point in time, jazz was rather young. Jazz, I guess, is probably about 100 years and change. Probably and a lot of change. Would, would you agree with that? But yeah. I mean, that's the other sad part is a lot of these guys, the music that they're doing is considered old, tired, cliche-ridden, uh, not very interesting anymore. And so you've got now rock is buying for 20 years old, but buying for 20 year olds using instruments that are not traditional in instruments. You've got guys like Beck, whose instrument is the Pro Tools, basically. I mean, he's, his music is taking a, a, a sonic sine wave, clipping it out of one section of a song, marrying it to another one, just because it looks nice on the screen, and seeing what happens. You know, you don't even have to know how to play guitar anymore. I mean, it's music by programmers in some instances, or it's going into a whole new thing. And so if you're on the other side of that, your audience is just as old as you are and probably not as interested. You probably, well, you've got a very odd historical museum quality about you. You know, it's like, oh, let's go see these guys. You know, they, they play that music that we've kind of heard about, you know. And so you're, you're like a living, it's like the old blues guys and in the 60s, they sort of rounded them all up and threw them out on tour and you went to see, you know, Howlin' Wolf, you went to see these 60 year old men kind of, you know, is he, is he gonna keel over tonight? Look at that, there's a booger coming out of his nose, you know, it's like, it's almost like, you know, a strange spectacle, you know, and, and it's, um, but then, you know, History is a strange way of coming around. Like, at some part in the cycle, like at one part in the cycle, you could be a laughing stock. A couple of years later, you're like, you're the king of the hill again. You know, Johnny Hartman is a, is a prime example. This is a fantastic singer who died broke, penniless. And then at the other end of the cycle, Clint Eastwood puts his music in, in Bridges of Madison County. Everybody loves Johnny Hartman now. The poor guy's dead, died broke. Jack Kerouac died with $47 in his bank account. They couldn't give his books away. Now, in the year 2000, 
But Jack Kerouac industry is a multi-million dollar industry. Ed Wood, drunk, penniless. His movies are making millions for somebody, not him. And it, it's, it's kind of a drag. It's almost like you gotta die to be successful or to be recognized, you know? And it's like, but it shouldn't be that. It should be like in France or Europe where you're celebrated while you're still alive and people can appreciate you while you're still alive and, and take care of you, you know? Like, you know, like, uh, rock writers, like people in the music industry, you shouldn't be laughing at some of these people. You know, you should be treating them with respect. You should be like, um, you know, it's almost like if you're a fan of these people, it's almost like your duty to kind of, if you can, do something for them, you know? Like, you know, try to give them a shot. I mean, you can't change people. You know, if you're going to jump off a cliff, you're going to jump off a cliff. But if, if you have the opportunity to go, you know, look, I'm going to put a net under there, just this once. See if you can bounce back. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. Or here's a cool, hot, young guy. Why don't you give him some of your road knowledge? Or what happens if we put the two of you together? You know, what's going to happen? You know? Tell, tell us a little bit about um, your performance, your performance tonight, why, why you continue to perform, where it's, uh, you know, you talk I, about I, 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 I'm almost like, you know, I, I, I went from a guy behind the scenes, like a guy sort of managing, a guy writing about the scene, a guy hanging out in the scene, to watching a lot of the guys that I really enjoyed being with and seeing perform kind of stop and seeing that whole spark, seeing like stuff that I really enjoyed not being created anymore. And, uh, and then it's at one point I sort of went, well, you know, maybe it's midlife crisis, I don't know. But I sort of went, well, if nobody else is doing what I, what I want to see, it's almost, like, it's, like it's almost like midlife crisis. Well, it's almost like, well, I miss all that stuff. And if, if nobody's doing that stuff, then I'm going to start doing it. And I'll find some of these old guys and incorporate them, you know, like I'll, I'll go grab Dave Rave and stick him on stage and we'll kind of create that excitement. This guy has so much knowledge, you know, and it's like being on tour with this guy, I'm learning, he's teaching me, you know, and, and it's like, and he sees in me like a lot of that naive, early energy, like here's a guy, you know, I don't have that jadedness, I've never played 52 bars every week or whatever, right? And, and so I'm, it's almost like I'm picking up the torch that a lot of these guys dropped, you know? But the difference is, you know, I've got a safety net. Um, I've been within the music industry. I've worked at record labels. Um, I know what the dangers are. Um, but I'm also not, it's not going to be the be all and end all of my life. You know, it's like it's it's an adjunct to it, and I. F but it's at the same time, it's almost like a lot of the people that I'm carrying the torch for. You know, I'm I'm facing the same obstacles now. Thirty years later, I'm I'm doing music that nobody really has a handle on. You can't really slot it anywhere. It's kind of a new kind of thing. Um, and maybe it's not, maybe what I'm doing is not of its time right now. Maybe my time is 10 years from now. But I may or may not be here 10 years from now. So it's kind of, I'm, I'm be I've become part of that cycle, which is kind of interesting. Um, and it's great because w when, when I go touring across Ontario, some of the guys come out, you know, like the Teenage Head guys and the Diodes guys and uh, some of the old scenesters come out and uh, and and you kind of you know they look up and here's a guy that they know me but they know me as somebody else and I'm up on stage doing all this stuff and and you could see them like kind of going come on Ralph go keep going you know come on man you know you go for it now you know and and then uh, and then I try to drag them up you know and kind of like come on you know like grab on again, let's go for it, you know, and, uh, 
and and it's also it, and it's cool that like you can see that you're inspiring like they kind of go oh, well well if you can do it and you know then you know I'm gonna try again you know I'll maybe take another approach another kick at the can at it you know like the greatest thrill like recently was uh, John Hamilton from the Diodes the old Diodes drummer uh, he found out I was doing a little recording session in Toronto and uh, he goes well can I just come and watch I said, yeah, come on down. And then I get a phone call. He goes, well, you think maybe I could bring my snare drum or something with me? I'm like, yeah, by all means, come on down. And next thing you know, he's like, he's kind of uh, drumming and he's sort of making arrangement suggestions. And, and I was kind of hoping he would do that, you know, because a lot of these guys have incredible knowledge, great musical knowledge. You know, it's just going to waste sitting there or they're playing some stupid club you know, doing cover tunes when some young band should go, hey man, Gordon Lewis, get in here, you know, like, what do you think, you know, are we doing it the right way, like, should we be doing something here? Um, so, it sounds like that's my contribution to it, you know, that's, it, it's like, we would always joke in the diodes, you go, it'd be really great if somebody covered Tired of Waking Up Tired, you know, and kind of, and then, I end up being the guy that covers Tired of Waking Up Tired <laughs> and, and introducing it to a whole new batch of people, you know, and, and it's like, you know, well, if nobody else is going to do it, then, you know, we'll do it, you know, and it's, you know, um, but, you know, you make your own bed, you lie, you lie, you can't make excuses for people, you know, like, you know, I mean, I've been lucky because I've always, I've always had a hunger to learn and, and to do different things and to try different things and not, you know, I, I, I used to be afraid at, at, at some point, but then, a, you know, a guy like Dave Rave kind of goes and goes, well, you know, what do you got to lose? Nothing. What do you got to gain? Everything. So why hold yourself back? Just kind of, just do it. What's the worst that could possibly happen? You know, you fall on your face. Well, so what? Just get back up again. Try again, you know. And uh, and I've started now, and I go on stage and stuff, and I, and I find myself in a tight spot. I kind of go, what would Dave do in a situation like this? You know, and it's, it's good to have that kind of reference point, because then all of a sudden, from out of a side of your brain, you'll hear a little voice go, well, you could sit back and not do nothing, or why don't you pick up a chair and start smashing it with your bare hands, you know, and then it's like, cool, you know, you find this inner strength, you know, to sort of, come on. How would you characterize musicians? To me, there's like two kinds of musicians. There's like businessmen who try to be musicians. And then there's musicians who are musicians. And of the two, the pure musician will always lose. Just because you, you're throwing this child out onto the street, and sooner or later he's going to get run over by a car. You know? The other guy, the businessman is, uh, who's a musician, yes, he'll be successful. He'll have the mansion. He'll have all the worldly goods. But he won't be the guy 10 years from now that you'll be spending 50 bucks buying a used record of. You know what I mean? Like, he won't be the guy you'll be buying books about. He won't be the guy you'll be collecting videos about. Because we're always going to be fascinated by failure, by the guy who aspired to it, but never made it. The guy who left us, the guy with the fractured legacy is always going to be the most interesting guy to, to read about, to try and, and learn from, you know, because you always want to be, well, I want to be like that guy, except I won't, I, I don't want to make the mistakes he made. It's, it's, it's like, how can I take, it's like punk, you know, like, the whole punk was based on failure. I mean, the 
whole notion of punk was based on Iggy Pop, MC5, Flaming Groovies, 60s Garage Bands. These were all bands that were failures. The, the Stooges albums came out, and within three or four months, they were deleted. Flaming Groovies never happened. You know, so what's going to happen to punk if you're basing your whole musical identity on, on, on bands that never made it? You know, the chances of you not making it are pretty good. <laughs> you know what I mean? How can you succeed doing music that the master th ha has not succeeded at, you know? But then you get into that cycle, you know? All of a sudden, because, all, because of all the new acolytes, Iggy Pop is on, is on top again. It's almost like, well, if, it, if all these guys are copying Iggy Pop, then what the hell is Iggy Pop all about? Why don't I go buy Iggy Pop records and see what's going on? You know, it's like when the Stones are doing Chuck Berry. When the Stones are doing Chuck Berry, Chuck Berry, you couldn't give away in America. This guy was a criminal, you know. And then it's like, you buy these Rolling Stones records, it's like, who, who's Chuck Berry? You know, and then you go buy Chuck Berry records, and oh, good old Chuck is back on the cycle again, you know. So it's almost like the best thing that could happen now is for people to go buy, you know, old teenage head records and stuff and rediscover these guys and give them a whole new breath of life, you know. And, and I think that's happening. There are a lot of people that care about Canadian rock history and not just, you know, like, it's like, you know, and I have this argument all the time. It's like, okay, Trooper, you know, one of the most successful Canadian rock bands of all time. Teenage Head, one of the most spectacular failures of Canadian rock of all time. Who are you, who are, who, which band do people still really care about or are interested in learning about? It ain't Trooper. It's Teenage Head, you know, it's like, because they've con actually contributed something to the fabric of, of, of Canadian rock culture, you know. Trooper contributed a lot of good party songs that you don't mind hearing on the radio, but I think that's about the extent of it. You know, you certainly don't like the Trooper for being at the forefront of a musical genre, you know. You know, I mean, granted, they are nice guys, and I've met them and worked with them, but... You know, it's not like Iggy Pop or The Velvet Underground or Patti Smith, you know. It's not like Bob Dylan. You know, it's kind of, do whatever, okay. You know, and I think that's always going to be, success is, is a relative thing, you know what I mean? Like, uh, are you successful because you're at the birth of a musical form that other people have become successful from, you know? I don't know. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just went on and on.